Now we're going to uh, uh, the next speaker is Espen Jonsen, <laughs> professor in art history at the University of Oslo. Uh, he has Scandinavian architecture and design from the 20th century as um, his fields of uh, research and teaching. His own research field is on modern and contemporary Norwegian architecture and design. He also is also the leader of uh, the research project Discords Norwegian Architecture in 1945 to 1965, with fur further research on Alling Viksjö and Pagan. So this is our man for all our questioning, all our questions concerning the E block. I think we will see. Well, uh, welcome to Espen Jonsson. Uh, my lecture will mainly be a combination of a reception study of Corbusier's visit to Oslo in 1933 and his potential impact on Norwegian architecture and especially going to discuss the interwar period. There's a lot of impact from Le Corbusier in the post-war period, but we, we don't have time to do that. Also, Sweden uh, has the most personal relationships uh, with uh, Le Corbusier, definitely. Denmark, as uh, Ruth uh, told us earlier today, has the more critical approach. But Norway definitely was the um, country, at least in these years, in the interwar period, that was, um, that Le Corbusier really got a large impact. Le Corbusier is still very much with us, wrote William Curtis in his article, Intersections, on the rereading of Le Corbusier. And Curtis pointed out that Corbusier's impact upon other artists and architects is much about ways of seeing, thinking, the image, and it is about the final forms. And Curtis argued that some of the architects who understood Le Corbusier best produced buildings which do not resemble his work at all. For Corbusier, architecture was the outer expression of complex ideas. For the ambitious, architect who wanted to understand Corbusier properly, it was necessary to find the right balance between the unique order uh, of his works and his general principles. And as Curtis pointed out, there is a constant oscillation between the individual statement and the type. For instance, how Willa Sawa illustrated his famous five points, or how Pavilion Swiss uh, also can be seen as an urbanistic manifesto and a slice of the collective housing in Villa Radius. But how do we study an inspiration from Le Corbusier? How do we actually study this type of potential impact, this type of influence linking to, the, uh, an, uh, linking to an architectural practice? Le Corbusier's buildings communicate before they are understood, writes Curtis, and he points out that the word influence can be misleading since it implies one-way flow from primary sources to the work of the followers. And it's simple as simple. It is seldom sim as simple as, as that. In reality, the process of transmission is far more complex as it, as it involves an active and sometimes critical rereading of examples at the points of reception. So architects inspired by Le Corbusier seems to have dealt with very uh, different kinds of mediums. And it's often a combination and synthesis of several types of impulses and mediums moving back and forth between critical reflection upon his texts and theoretical proportions and the direct experience of seeing his buildings. So one type of impulses represents the ex experience of uh, seeing work, uh, Corbusier's work in situ, seeing his building firsthand, while older is to meeting him personally at the office or at the conference or uh, being uh, listened to his lecture or uh, studied his publications. Uh, and um, so to understand Corbusier, one must therefore switch back and forth between different types of mediums as an intermediality. Okay. Um, and, and it's also, remember to uh, that Thomas also already has pointed out, he has this combination as an artist, architect, and so on. And that role of the architect also made that he got a big impression of, of, the, of the Norwegian architects as well. So uh, let me now continue um, about uh, discussing some of the impact that he might have. And the first uh, period we can talk about is the pioneer 
from uh, fast from the years 1918 to 1925. In these years, it was the Norwegian painters, female painters, who first became aware of Charles Edouard Chandelier. Art historian Hilde Mörk has written about Ragnhild Kaiser, Charlotte Wankel, and Ragnhild Korbe, and how he, they become aware of Fernand Lecher, Amade Osenfa, and Le Corbusier's idea to unite painting and architecture. Particularly became Charlotte Wankel very early aware of Le Corbusier's painting since she already in 1918 visited Chandré and Osenfa's exhibition at the Galerie Thomas and also at uh, the subsequent exhibition in uh, Galerie Drouet. And in 1922, Wankel returned to Oslo and started to draw on a small villa for her parents. And Merck argues that an inspiration by Le Corbusier appears in this first dra draft. But unluckily not yet found, only the final in a typical Scandinavian neoclassicism from the early 1920s. But what about the architects? Um, Ruth has already mentioned uh, Edward Heiberg. Also, at this moment, he was definitely Norwegian. And during his stay um, in, uh, in, in uh, Paris in, in um, 1922 and 1923, he met Le Corbusier, tried to get a job there, he didn't get that, but he published in 1923 in Bygekunst the first article that um, presented Le Corbusier's radical ideas including Masson, Citroën, and Ville Contemporain in Scandinavia. This was the first article in Scandinavia. And um, uh, uh, moving back from Paris, he visited the Bauhaus exhibition, and then he began to make some drawing of his own house, built one year, year later at a sloping plot outside of Copenhagen. And this appears as a synthesis of impulses, um, both from uh, Adolf Meyer's Georg Muckes house, House on Horn. Um, you can see that this is uh, the House on Horn by Georg Mucha and Adolf Meyer, especially in the organization of the space um, with a big salt commune and then uh, the organization of the, the, the old uh, rooms around it. But also, it is possible to see it as an inspiration from Le Corbusier. Um, especially um, the design of the living room and the large iron window. The across the room is a dominant feature in Corbusier's houses from the early 1920s, as we see in the Atelier Osenfant, um, and also in the Masson Citroën. And, in, and uh, he also commented on this uh, uh, in another review, that it definitely uh, 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 What's going to say, um, a concept made of a small room with higher, uh, a small higher room with other rooms um, uh, around them, exactly as, exactly as large as you need them. And uh, also, an early draft by Heiberg had a barrel shaped ceiling and a, and a solution with a large panoramic window and a curved ceiling that also re reminds of, of Le Corbusier's Masson Manul. And it must also be mentioned that Heiberg in 1925 in Paris, in the exhibition there, exhibited a um, chair with adjustable back, inspired by uh, the foreigner, uh, inspired by Le Corbusier's um, Citroën project, a, 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 um, a draft of, the, of, a, of a chair that reminded of this design, and also that can be seen as a forerunner for Charlotte Perriot and Ches Le Corbusier's Ches Longs that uh, were not finished before, um, or had launched that before 1929. Okay, uh, if we move further, we have the next period that we can call the more confused breakthrough of, of uh, functionalism in Norway. Um, and um, in these years, as you have hold in some inspiration from Holland, Germany, um, but also, of course, from Le Corbusier. Uh, that from 1925 on, onwards was uh, an architect imp impossible to ignore. And in the media, he served as an open port to modernism. He was a lot published in Norwegian media, for instance. Media loved to interview him. And um, he was a high interesting figure, both in the academic circles as, less, uh, as, well, as well for the intellectuals. 
Some Norwegian architects were aware of Corbusier through the Paris exhibition 1925, other through this um, um, Weissenhof exhibition in 1927, which was widely attended by Norwegian architects that visited the Weissenhof um, exhibition, etc. And also already in 1927, Johan Elefsen's manifest uh, commented on uh, this building and its relationship to Norwegian folk architecture. So let us now move further on to the visit. Thursday, the 26th of January, Aftenposten on its front page uh, enlightened their readers that Le Corbusier would possibly came to Oslo the following week. Um, he at the moment stayed in Stockholm, invited by the Svenska Arkitektforening. On that occasion, Oslo Arkitektforening tried to get the famous and controversial architect to Oslo. Four days later, the same newspaper informs that Le Corbusier comes to Oslo on Tuesday. Um, as a collaboration between OAF and Alliance Francaise. Um, and he was uh, supposed to give the title Re Revolution Architecturale in Universitet in Avila, and it was open to the public. And this way of traveling around talk had since 1924 been a strategy for Corbusier for how he, he could spread his ideas. He visits in Stockholm, Gothenburg and Oslo, was partly be seen as a part of such a strategy. Um, and the dog brother published the same day an interview with Corbusier made in Stockholm, who gave him some a hint on what he might uh, see as his agenda. And Corbusier stated that his concern for the last years has been an academic backlash against modernism, especially in Paris, in Germany, and in Russia. And he was also a kind of ambivalent about the Swedish functionalism. And he denied that he was not a quite special as an architect. He was not a functionist either. He was more than one who has discovered the sun. <coughs> but I write for architects. I'm making poems for them. And then 7 o'clock, uh, Tuesday evening, January the 1st, he enters uh, out of the train from Stockholm. He came alone, only carrying a small suitcase. And on the platform, he was welcomed by uh, the Alliance Francaise Vice Chairman, <coughs> the architect Henrik Nissen, and also the more famous modernist uh, Eivind Mulstua. And 20 minutes past eight, um, uh, five minutes late, but evening dressed, Le Corbusier was faced with an almost full avula. And here he, we see him gesticulating during the lecture with a glass of water in the background, as he always should have wanted to be served towards the end of the lecture. It was not uncommon that Corbusier's lecture could have an audience of three or four thousand people, and uh, Le Corbusier himself was very proud that he was able to keep the audience attention for up to three and four hours. <laughs> His lecture was announced in French, but sources indicate that he spoke German. Um, he began, quite uh, charming, by um, informing the audience that uh, his child and youthhood in Switzerland at 1,000 meters high, that he was very familiar with snow and severe winters. Um, and the further content of the uh, lecture is mostly known, since it was entirely translated in Bygge Kunst. Then uh, presented uh, as a new B-plan and not given the title, uh, The Revolution of Architecture. Um, and he has this combination and, um, that he began to talk about this uh, architectural revolution, and then he, he, the most of the lecture was about urban issues. Tim Benton has highlighted um, that uh, this kind of lecture was so important, um, and, and he, it was especially important for the younger audience. Um, um, and also, in a typical manner, uh, he did this performance in a combination of drawing while lecturing. So, if we look at the drawings, we would see that um, the first two illustrated the um, architectural revolution before he went on to urban issues and the importance of light, air, and solar time, and the need for efficient uh, transport. Further, he um, uh, explicitly addressed how the city for the future should consist of sky, trees, steel, and concrete. 
all aspects of uh, the Villa Rodius, the brilliant and happy tone, the radiant city. Before he finished with sketches of his city plans for Montevideo uh, and Rio de Janeiro. And according to the report, the uh, Cobusiers mastered to keep the audience attention and was answered with a prolonged excited applause. And the lecture would last for two and a half hours. And, and then Cobusier was so tired, so he dropped the, the conclusion. <laughs> the original plan was that Cobusier would leave Oslo the morning after. But he decided to stay one extra day. And along with OAF, uh, he traveled around the city and visited, among others, Frognesheten and the Viking Ship Museum. But he shall be especially interested in the integration of art and architecture, uh, especially in Munch's Aula, but also in Per Krog's decoration in Oslo Lysverker by the architects Berke and Eliasen. He had many nice words to say about the city's most modern architecture, but this completely faded in the meeting with older Norwegian folk architecture and the Norsk Folk Museum. He was gone for several hours, they didn't know where he were, and then they, some, some people uh, became aware that he has been at the Norsk Folk Museum. Because Corbusier was thrilled and stated to the popular press, this is real functionalism. His plan was now to return to Norway during the summer to study the buildings more in situ. And he then wanted to cancel his plan to study architecture in Italy. And in the following days, the newspapers report that Le Corbusier has become extremely popular during his visit, in particular at the club National Expressen, Tostrup Gorn, where many journalists mingled and where he spent some hours talking, gesturing and drawing. Um, uh, Pierre Chanere, as uh, Thomas has already mentioned, is known as Le Corbusier's cousin and very close collaborator, but it was a large surprise that Corbusier also had a cousin in Oslo. The restaurateur Jacques, the chef at Bagatelle in Bygdalia, who met him at the station, and also that he, in the, for the press, made a drawing um, uh, of, of, of the chef, uh, the, the diploma of honor. In 1933, most of the capitals of Oslo's architects practices functionalism. And you also know that Corbusier visited some architectural offices in Oslo. For instance, uh, Blocksdemeter Kors office in the top of Old Fellow Gård. Um, uh, the architects behind this remarkable building um, here. Um, and not only a few months later, uh, they were meeting each other again. Then, uh, on board on the Patrice Du, during the mythical conference sign for dis discussing the topic, the functional city. And on board this, we have received uh, Hermann Mutter Costa listening to Le Corbusier. And uh, on the following day, they presented their plan for Oslo. Um, or not a plan, but the analyze of Oslo. Blockstam and Tukos, they represent the first generation of Norwegian architects born in between 1980 and 1900, very become familiar with Le Corbusier in the 1920s, and they preferred the purist style and the machine to live in, in some sense. That was their reference. And as a CM delegate, Mente Kors followed Corbusier's practice, wrote articles about him, and they also had some private correspondence. Um, and Mente Kors often in his articles stressed Corbusier's role and ability to um, to, to produce these architectural ideas in books and in media. But those from the years from 1933 that become more interested in, um, uh, in, in Le Corbusier is the one that we can call um, uh, the architectural environment at Arkitektteatre in the Rosenkrantz, Rosenkrantz Gate 10 on the top of the functional building Oslo Ny Teater. Here we have a lot of important architects that would, that would had, de, had de, uh, different uh, offices, but in the same building. For this younger generation, born around 1900 to 1920, Uwe Bang, Korsmo, Knut Knutsen, Erling Wiksjö, Le Corbusier's architectural turning point around 1929, 
and to 1933 had a very great influence on their practice. And this shift in Le Corbusier's practice was shown in Oeuvre Complete, Volume 2, moving away from the pure white villas towards the more regional interpretation combined with urban engagement. In Pavillon Swiss, the young architects saw a synthesis of a social content combined with a more poetic approach and a mastery of technique that I really admire. Among these architects, we see an increasing willingness to process Corbusier's ideal until the war broke out in, in, in 1940. I think there is no environment in the western part of Europe that admire Corbusier so much in these years. Um, the composition of building vol volumes becomes more freer. Uh, here's Ove Bang, also an important figure here. Um, uh, it's more focused on the artistic concepts. There are more attention to the architectural promenade um, and the experience of the space and so on. Um, natural stone is combined with concrete experimentation. Visual art become more integrated into the architecture. And it's also a more romantic approach to the relationship between building and landscape that one see in the Norwegian architecture in these years. Um, and uh, the personal connections is also very important. Uh, Uwe Bank, for instance, um, uh, visited Le Corbusier in 1934, and when Le Corbusier visited Uwe Bank's office, there is a myth that he was also making a drawing in one of his villas. Um, and we have, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we don't know for sure, but maybe that is true. Um, but this impact in this um, uh, architectural environment you can see in different um, uh, typologies. Uh, and one is detached houses and summer cabins, a second one is urban planning and social housing, and a third one is public buildings. So let us now continue with detached houses. Of large villas is of course Arne Cosmos Villa Stenersen. Uh, and over Bonks Villa Dittler Simonsen, the most prominent. Uh, we can, for instance, here also look uh, at one of these first early drafts of Villa Stenersen that obviously has a reference to the um, Villa La Roche Chanere from 1923-1924 in, in, in Paris. Uh, and also the drawings um, done at Uwe Bonks office is clear uh, also in its style and its concept and, ha and obviously impact from, from Le Corbusier. And also the art historian Marlene Helgeland has pointed out how, for instance, the Le Corbusier use the golden section in, in, uh, in, uh, in um, Villa Dittla Simonsen. In Villa Stenersen there are also other references, uh, but in general there are a little doubt that both he and Knud Knudsen uh, had studied the second volume of Oeuvre Complete. Um, and både, both Knudsen's Villa Nölke and Cosmos Summer House for Heyerdahl reminded of Le Corbusier's uh, Summer House for Madame de Madandro um, in its concept as well as in a theoretical level, especially it, the, the way of the adaption to the plot, the site, its irregular shape and also the rustic expression and the use of local stone. Uh, okay, let us now take the next here, um, urban planning and social housing. Uh, Kobe's yes, lecture on urban house issues affected definitely uh, this environment. Um, as mentioned, also the newspapers followed up their interest for Kobe's in articles. And for instance, the Kobe's draft of Le Chedrup in Antwerp was published in Aftenposten already in 1933. And this proposal seems to have a special relevance for architects like Bang and Wiksjö and was included in Le Corbusier's La Ville de Rodius, Radiant City. Bang's interest in this book is important to understand the um, commitment um, that he now adds in urban issues and the design of public buildings. He was uh, thrilled in his review of these books, the technical culture, the, um, and so on. Um, and he also 
uh, explain or express how Corbusier shows us an enormous potential and an enormous potential beauty for the future city. In these years also, uh, Jan Reiner, and former Czechoslovakian assistant at Le Corbusier's office, comes to Oslo and stay there from 1935 to 1937-38. That was also, uh, he, he, and Jan Reiner, he played a role in spreading his extensive knowledge, both of urban planning and of Le Corbusier, both through lectures, articles in the daily press, but also in bigger kunst and, of course, at the bank's office. Um, yeah, you may see this impact in uh, this uh, project for Vestervika, for instance, but also in the project I did together uh, here in um, for, for uh, Obos. They drafted here an apartment block. Remember now that we, when we saw the um, uh, Marshall block, uh, it was finished in uh, 1952, but here you see the same ideas. Uh, in, in 1935 um, In order to provide a green view for the residents, one of the, 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 the building must move upward, they argued. And um, the solution was this uh, glass walled, narrow, deep apartments over two floors, and so on. Um, the architects also did a um, second revised uh, project of this uh, project for the UBUS. Um, and at the same time, they criticized the tightly packed high rise buildings along Kirkevejen. And they called them a stone cemetery for the living. Also, the functional buildings uh, uh, that are uh, close to Marienlust. Uh, and influenced by Villa Radius and their desire to provide nature for all, they also did this um, uh, revised project for this obus, with two extremely long, continuous, high rises building, um, 30 meters tall, 30 meters tall, 12 meters wide, and situated at least 100 meters apart. Um, and if, if you see. Um, also, the, also, this should be sport and outdoor activities, etc. Something, and as as we see on the site plan, it would totally smash the royal palace in dimensions. The Marxist and the left-wing oriented plan group, they had an ambivalence towards Le Corbusier. Uh, they were still not aware that he was not a communist, but they, they thought in the early 30s they thought that he was still, still. Um, uh, on the left wing. Uh, and um, Evke Rolfsen, he uh, did, um, uh, obviously had studied the Villa Rius, and he did this radical sketch proposal from Oslo from 1935 with a vast residential belt that should be with um, eight floor high rise buildings, formed like an amphitheater in a sloping terrain towards the historic city. Obviously inspired of Le Corbusier's proposals for Namur. And an alternative, an alternative sketch on the same idea proposed 2,000 high-rise buildings on 12 floors. Okay, then let us take the last part, the public buildings. Um, and then restricted more or less to the competition in 1940 for the new government building. Nobody won the competition, but four of the entries got a prize, among them two projects made by architects from Bank's office. Over Bank's draft um, was uh, loaded for its final location, which to take into account the lighting conditions. But in Erling Wiksjö's uh, draft Vestibule, we find an advanced use of impulses from Le Corbusier's that relate both to style, conceptual and formal approaches and the relationship between architecture and art. Also, this is the first proposal Victor made. He did a revised proposal after the war in '46, and then a new proposal in 1952. That is more or less the final one. Uh, at least the final one is in 1954. But now we talk about his first proposal for this building in 1938, 1939-1940. Um, in an advanced way, the building in its narrow form 
relates to Corbusier's building in Moscow, but also to the Pavillon Swiss. Uh, and in the relationship between architecture and sculpture, um, uh, it's obvious that Victor has studied Le Corbusier's controversial proposal for a League of Nations in Geneva. And especially in this relationship between sculpture and, and, um, and also this, um, there's a link in this sculpture that also linked to, to um, Marcus uh, Plassen. And later on in Victor's drawing, you find also this link to Marcus Plassen. So Marcus Plassen is also a common l reference for both Corbusier and Arling Victor. Um, and the most important reference for Victor Dove is a project Le Corbusier made in Rio. Uh, and that is his first proposal that, that he made there. Um, and that especially relates to the relationship between architecture and sculpture. We can see that in, in this uh, in these drawings. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let us move further to the concluding uh, remarks here. Also, Cosmo, Bank, Knudsen, and Victor, they all visited Paris during this period. They look at his building. Some of them also visited his office. Uh, and it's even though some of these references is very uh, formal, they, uh, without doubt, shared an admiration for his building, but also they had to study his books, and especially this over the complete, that seems very important for them. So this kind that, uh, of, of um, impact seems to be this combination of study the building as well as the different type of media. Um, Curtis, he points out that when we discuss the influence of Corbusier, a broad distinction can be drawn between those who end up with creating as stale imitations and academic, and academic cliches. Those who copy and devalue Corbusier's works and those who dig down to principles and architectural ideas before effecting transformation on their own. Looking at the example of the practice of Uwe Bong and Anneling Victor, from 1935 to 1940, they seem to have both. Projects that both imitate, combines formal solutions to new syntheses as well as they create more independent interpretations. In Bong and Reines' residence for Urbus, they appear very, very close to Corbusier's own solutions. And probably was the admiration for the Viradian city too large and the access to Corbusier's practice with Reiner too close that they managed to distance, distance him themselves from their hero. In the domestic architecture, Bang was more independent, partly with new syntheses such as Ditlev Simonson, but also in other small single family houses that I have known shown here. The architect that definitely should follow Bang's track was um, obviously Arling Wikström. As late as uh, not only in the 1930s, but he continued in 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 his uh, interest for um, Corbusier. Not in the first years, but for 1948 and so on, he came inspired once again of Corbusier, but then in a more critic, partly critical manner. Um, the impact of Corbusier continues in the post-war period, not only by Victor, especially by the Pagan group we can see both an admiration and an ambivalence. And some references are quite obvious, for instance, by Mielva, that we see here, and also by uh, Robert E. Steyl. And dialogues with Corbusier, we might also found in church architecture, for instance, here by um, Odd Østby, uh, and also by Knut Knudsen's um, uh, students, like at Gergelis, for instance, Gergelisens, but probably the deepest and most independent understanding seems to be by Sverre Fjell. Yeah. Okay, then I thought 32 minutes, I'm finished. Yeah. <laughs>